chapter 21. It is the historical book, really, of the New Testament. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the book of Acts, which gives you the history of what took place in that first century. Acts chapter 21, I'm going to start reading in verse number 27. We've covered through verse 26. We will finish the chapter up here and and go from there. Again, the rest of the book of Acts from this point on, from chapter 21 on, is just really one primary event. I do believe we will cover the remaining chapters uh, fairly quickly. Although I did think I'd get well into chapter 22 for this message, but that didn't happen either. (laughs) Ended up being just through the the rest of chapter 21, but boy, an important subject here. I think it can be helped to uh, all of us here. Verse 27 says this, When the seven days were almost ended, the Jews were of Asia. When they saw him in in the temple, that would be the Apostle Paul, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him crying out, men of Israel, help, this is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city uh, Tromephus, an Ephesian whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved, and the, upro- and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came to the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left the beating of Paul. And the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. Some cried one thing, some another uh, among the multitude, and we could not know the certainty for the tumult. He commanded him to be carried into the castle. When he came to the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people, for the multitude of the people followed uh, followed after crying away with him. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee, who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art thou not that Egyptian, which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers? But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city of, uh, of Sicilia, a citizen of no mean city. I beseech thee, Suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs, now get this, beckoned with his hand unto the people, and there was made a great silence. And he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, and then chapter 22 we'll go into when he addresses the mob. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I do ask your blessing upon the service today. Lord, I pray that you control what I say and how I say it. I I certainly know I need your mercy and grace. Lord, I pray that your word and your spirit would work, that it would strengthen, that it would draw us closer to you, that it would feed your people. Lord, help us to be focused on you. I pray this time would not be in vain, but that you would use your word to stir stir hearts to do it as it is supposed to do when it is preached, to reprove, rebuke, exhort, Lord, to challenge us. And if there's anyone here that has never truly been converted, I pray... Lord, that the gospel would convict their heart. Lord, that perhaps even this morning that would draw them in and they would repent and place their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, please work. Again, Father, I love you. I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, last time we were in the book of Acts, we saw really the humility of Paul with what took place. He has just returned to Jerusalem from his third missionary journey. We dealt with how excited he was. He was bringing representations from all three missionary journeys he took were with him. Uh, um, He's bringing people from the churches. He has an enormous uh, uh, offering, a monetary offering to give to Jerusalem because of the suffering that they were enduring, of all the persecution that was taking place to the very first church that ever existed, which was in the city of Jerusalem. So he gets there, he introduces them to Luke, to Titus, uh, uh, to all, Gaius, to all the men that traveled with him, telling them where they're from, what God did in those areas, what God did in Philippi, what God did in Thessalonica, what he did in Corinth, what he did in Ephesus. 
And they're hearing all this. And if you remember, James, who was the pastor at this time of the church of Jerusalem, the half-brother of the Lord, he's pastor, and and he, he basically, when he responds, he doesn't even address the greatness of all that God did. You see, he knew Paul coming into Jerusalem had many enemies because the Judaizers had spread lies about this man because this man is making a tremendous impact for the cause of Christ. The Jews see him as a major threat. In my trip to Israel um, last year, last January, a year ago, when the church sent me and Marianne to Israel, we had a, we had a Jewish guide who I became uh, friends with. I enjoyed his company. He, <coughs> excuse me. He was an Orthodox Jew, and, and we, I'd have discussions with him every time I could. Of course, And he gets this all the time. He is used to leading Christian groups. So I understood that coming in, and I understood, though, I still have a responsibility to, to try and talk with this man. And so we actually got into some good discussions. I remember one day we were waiting for the bus to come pick us up, and we got on the subject of the Apostle Paul. And, and you could see the hatred in his eyes, and I kid you not. He said, he said, I'm all right with Jesus, but not Paul. And he actually blamed all of Christianity on the apostle Paul. And he said, he hated Jews. I said, he was one. I said, he didn't hate him at all. I said, you don't even know what the Bible says. He says, no, I know what it says. I said, do you know that he wished he could take your place, that he would go to hell for you? And at first he was like, I don't think he said that. And I showed him in Romans chapter 10. Yes, he did. I said, he had a love for you greater than you could imagine. And so Paul here has those, that same level of hatred, the lies and all that's being spoken about him. He knows that. So James, and I, I pointed this out last time we were in the book of Acts. I said, listen, so often we as God's people, we can focus on all the negative that's going on and actually miss the greatness of what God is actually doing. James missed the great testimonies of meeting Luke and Titus and all the works that God is doing because he was so focused on the negative people. Listen, don't miss what God is doing because you're trying to please those who more than likely you're never going to please. So James had asked Paul to take a Nazarite vow, which Paul had no problem with. He took one, if you remember, back when he was in Macedonia. Or Achaia was when he took it. So he, he has no problem with that, but he submits to the pastor. He agrees to do it and showing his humility. You know, I love that. I love the humility. I believe that carried him so far in life was his humility. He in no way shows that he gets offended because James pretty much just ignored the greatness of the report that Paul gave of all that God did. He doesn't show at all he's offended. He doesn't say, wait, did you not just hear what I said? No, he just, all right, you want me to do that? I'll do it. And so now we come up to the text is what takes place at the end of this vow. What I want us to see today is is how we can handle when we face a great enemy. What to do when circumstances in life are completely overwhelming you. When life is just beating you down. What to do uh, when life uh, uh, becomes so difficult. Paul, even in our text, is literally at the point of death in our text. How we respond to difficult times, how we respond to our enemies, how we respond when life doesn't go the direction we plan is very important. We're going to look at the reality of enemies, the requirement of faith, and the requirement of hope. Those three things, I believe, are key in what to do when life overtakes you, and we'll look at that. Now, before I get into those points, though, I need to establish what is taking place here. <clears throat> this event again, Paul is going to be in prison. Last time we saw Paul was in Jerusalem. It is the Feast of Pentecost. That's important for what's taking place here. He has agreed to take the Nazarite vow, and now it is the seventh day of that vow in, in our reading. On the third day and on the seventh day, he has to present himself. So he's at the end of it, and he is presenting himself, and that's when this uproar occurs. Now, think of how this, how this group of Jews that are from Asia, I'll cover more of that in a minute, how they're able to use that. This is the Feast of Pentecost. By this time, now, it, when, you, when you go to the Old Testament, the Feast of Pentecost was first fruits. It was a celebration of the harvest and all that was taking place. But by this time, that had somewhat changed. 
that had changed after the exile. This became a celebration, not only of first fruits, but much, much more so of the giving of the law. And so it was a celebration of the law of God. When God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, it was said uh, uh, by Jewish tradition that the law of Moses was given 50 days after the Exodus. So I want you to think about that. Here's all these travelers. It, the place is swollen because of the importance of this feast. Of all the Jews who have traveled into Jerusalem, it is said the population, again, would be somewhere between 1 to 2 million people. And at this day and time in the first century, that is incredible. And they're there celebrating the law. And so Paul is there presenting himself at the temple. And the Bible says how the Jews from Asia recognize him. Again, this is not speaking of China. This is Asia Minor, Bible times modern-day Greek. So these, these Jews there would be from Ephesus, which was part of Paul's third missionary journey, which Paul spent the longest time there, just about three years he is in Ephesus. He's there three years, and remember... <laughs> The, the, the revival that took place in Ephesus, the lives that were changed. So these were men that are still remnants of that synagogue that was there. They see Paul. They see one of the men that is also with him from Ephesus. And they begin to cry out when they see him. They begin to stir up the people. They begin to cry out for help. Men of Israel, help, help. They grab Paul and a mob forms. They're yelling out of some major crime has occurred, as some great blasphemy has occurred in the temple. They give out three charges against Paul, against his own people, against the law, and against the temple. How he would teach against the law of Moses, making these outlandish charges. None of them are true. They even said he brought a Gentile into the temple, which was, of course, a lie. The Gentiles, remember, were only allowed in the outer court. That was it. Now, by this time, it was actually called the Court of Gentiles, the Outer Court. That was actually the name given to it. And, and, and as you got a little bit more into the temple, um, you had the Court of Women, and then, then the place the men can go, then the priest, then you get in all the way into the holy place, the most holy place, and, and, and so on. But the Gentiles could just come into that outer court, and that was it. So they charged Paul that he brought a Gentile past the outer court. Now, what's interesting is at this time in 1871 and in 1935, archaeologists discovered two actual signs that were placed on the outer court of the temple at this time. They both had the exact same wording. Let me read to you what it said. It said, no man of alien race is to enter in within the barricade that goes around the temple. And if anyone is taken in the act, let him know that he himself to blame for the penalty of death that follows. And Rome allowed that. Rome allowed that if a Gentile went past the outer court, that they were allowed to execute that person. And so they had signs posted. If a Gentile steps into this area, we will kill you. And the death is your own fault. So they saw with Paul earlier, Trometheus, and, and they assumed that Paul brought him in. And I'll deal later on with how our assumptions can get us in a lot of trouble. And there's no way Paul does that. Paul's in the middle of a Nazarite vow. He's not going to put his, the life of his friend in jeopardy. It, it's, it's completely impossible. They assumed and they lied. And by the way, I want you to think about this. Even if Paul did that, which he did not, the penalty of death would not be on Paul. It would be on the Gentile. That's the one who they had permission to execute, not Paul. So this was just all pretense because they knew who they wanted dead. That is Paul. So anything they can conjure up, anything they can say, anything these enemies can do against him, and many times when we face enemies in difficult times in life, it just seems if anything they can conjure up, they create. So they get the mob raging, they draw Paul out, and the Bible says the doors were shut. That's important. What that means is they are going to kill Paul. They don't want his blood to defile the temple. 
They know an execution is is coming. Paul knows it's coming. When Paul sees the doors are shut, Paul knows, as far as he knows at this moment, he will be dead in minutes. And as the door is shut, the beating begins. A severe beating. The beating is designed to kill him. The mob is in a frenzy. You can just imagine what Paul must be thinking. This is it. It's over. I mean, blow after blow. He sees the door shut. He knows what they, he knows this means they will kill me. However, the highest ranking person in Judea happens to be right there. He is present. We learn his name later. It does not give the name in chapter 21. When you get over chapter 22, 23, it actually does give his name, Claudius. He was the commander of the Roman army stationed in Jerusalem. When the governor was not, the governor was stationed in, he, he, his, his place of residence was actually in Caesarea, the political capital of the province. So when the governor wasn't present, this was the leading authority. He is right there. Now, the Roman army actually had a fortress, Fort Antonia, which is literally connected to the temple. The fortress butted right up against it on the north side. It had a great tower so they could overlook Jerusalem and overlook the temple area. It had a great observation. There was at least a minimum of a thousand soldiers that were stationed right there at that fort. They they would all be highly trained and skilled in dealing with riots. And interesting enough, going to this courtyard, they had stairs that led right to it. They had stairs going from, from, from their fortress right down into that courtyard. They could be there in seconds. So Claudius... Word gets to him quickly. He looks out. He can see the mob, the riot forming, not knowing what's taking place. Plural is used, so he takes at least a minimum of 200 soldiers with him. Those 200 soldiers are, are gathered. They're coming rushing down the stairs. They're heading into the court of the Gentiles. They see the mob there. The beating is taking place. Um, <clears throat> uh, they, they, they head just outside of it. They get there. And then once they see the commander, the beating stops. I can just imagine what Paul must have looked like at this point. How beaten he had been. How bloodied he was. The commander has Paul grabbed and chained. And he's trying to demand, who is this man? What did he do? What's going on? He's trying to figure out the situation. By the way, I want you to think about this. When Paul is now chained, this is the Apostle Paul. I have no doubt what came to his mind, that prophecy that he was just been given. If you remember, Agabus, the prophet, gave him, he used that that illustration of him uh, on his own self, grabbing Paul's belt and binding himself, letting him know that the man to whom this this belongs to, he is going to be bound by the Gentiles. So Claudius is trying to get the information about who this man is. One, One group saying one thing, another group's another. He's not getting anything out of the crowd. It was too big of a ruckus with everyone yelling. So then he has Paul carried to the castle. The crowd, though, wants him dead. They want Paul back. Literally, by the wording what takes place when they get to the stairs, because of the violence of the mob, soldiers had to lift Paul over their head. The crowd wanted him dead. They cried out, away with him. The last time we had a mob here crying that out was 27 years earlier with the Lord Jesus Christ. As the guards are now carrying him on those stairs to the fortress, Paul speaks to the commander in Greek, which shocked him. You see, he assumed Paul was this Egyptian criminal, a murderer. Who had, who had gathered, he was a cult leader, put together a band of rebels that was against Rome and against Israel. He wanted Jews dead as well. The Egyptian was some type of false prophet. 
Josephus even wrote about him, about his 4,000 assassins, and how the governor prior to this event had found out about him. They actually had a confrontation where, where the Roman army was able to kill several hundred of them, and the rest all fleed, including the leader. And so the commander at the time actually thought that the man he just chained was the leader of this group because what they were doing now is they would wait for these key events. When millions were present, they would literally go into into the temple area and they'd have daggers with them and that's how they would assassinate. They would quickly kill and then blend right back into into the crowd. Matter of fact, remember the high priest at the time of Christ's death, Annas, his son Jonathan was murdered that way by one of these men. And so he hears Paul, Paul speak, and Paul tells him who he is. I'm a Roman citizen. I grew up in Tarsus. I'm a Jew. He then asks for permission to speak to the mob. And the commander grants it. Now, let me get into the points now that we have the setting in place. And from this we can learn a great deal of how to handle one our enemies or how to handle it when life is just overtaking you. When things are difficult, when things are beating you down, and again, I want to see the reality of enemies, the requirement of faith, and the requirement of hope. So let's get into this. First off, the reality of enemies. The Apostle Paul was well aware on his trip to Jerusalem. I mean, he heard it everywhere he went. He's headed into territory where it is full of his enemies. He knew this was coming. And listen, that is a major part of the battle for us. In no way does God ever promise that life is going to be a bed of roses for you. You will face difficulty. You will face trying times. You will face enemies. Trials will come. Don't be surprised. The Bible even tells us, it gives us this advice in 1 Peter 4.12. Think it not strange. When those fiery trials come, it's going to take place. The first piece of advice that I can give you is simply know that it is coming. Don't be surprised. Get ready. Get prepared. See, that the, the issue is, is in having an understanding that, listen, difficult days will come. You have to be able to act in those times and not react. You have to have a game plan set. This is what I will do. Because Paul was well aware this battle's coming. He knew exactly how he was going to handle this. Don't allow the emotion of hurt all of a sudden to guide you. You need to allow wisdom from a biblical preparation to guide you through the hurt in the moment. And sometimes it can get so difficult. I thought about this in this text. That not even your friends help. I mean, when Paul's being beaten, where's James? James. Why isn't James trying to defend him? Say, no, he's, he's a Nazarite vow. He's not against the law. That's not true. Now, he might not have been there. I, I'm making an assumption there a little bit. But, but none of the elders? We see no one come to Paul's defense? The truth is there are times when life can overtake you. When it feels like it's just, just all around you, just too difficult. Sometimes we can feel overwhelmed. Times come when circumstances can be so overwhelming. A big part of the battle is knowing what to do when it comes being prepared. Listen, let's go back to December 7th of 1941. Why was Pearl Harbor so successful for the Japanese? We didn't believe it was coming. Now, through God's sovereignty, some key ships were not in port. But nonetheless, from a Japanese perspective, apart from those ships not being there, wow. They had the element of complete surprise on that Sunday morning. You have to be ready. You have to know that it's coming. You can even see the tactics that Paul's enemies used in this text. One, they will lie. 
many times I deal with people who do face literal enemies that simply lie and lie and lie. That's common. They themselves will choose to believe lies. As we saw in our test, they also make assumptions. Usually, we assume the worst in people because oddly enough, it's what we want to believe. There's times I've gotten phone calls and meetings with people where they're making assumptions about others that I am just stunned. There's been times I've taken calls where they're making assumptions about different situations where I I, I can think of times where I've already known exactly what's taking place, yet the assumptions they drew from that were outrageous. These men make the assumptions about what Paul did. They just assume because, oh, this guy's against the law. It wasn't true. Because they had that that false presupposition in place when they saw the other man from Ephesus with him, they assumed, oh, he would bring him in. Not true. We see that your enemies many times will want to convince others to agree with them, to align with them, It's amazing how that begins to take place, that game. And many times in the end, just like these men here, they simply want to destroy. There's things about Paul's life that really did help him deal with the enemy. Before I move on to point two, I think there's one of those that I should cover. This is true so much of the life of the Apostle Paul that goes with his humility. Now listen, The Apostle Paul was not a self-centered man. He was not. For you to successfully handle your enemies, you cannot be self-centered. Because your pride will simply lead to contention. That's all it'll do. When you make life all about you, and let's think about it. We have now probably had 40 to 50 years in this country of, of, of more than one generation raised being told life is about you. No, it's not. You believe the lie and it's leading to your own misery. Even in his response, Paul's response, he tries to reach those that are trying to kill him. He's concerned about him. I mean, he he could have argued the injustice. You're not even allowed to kill me. I'm not a Gentile. I never brought him in, but even if I did, you don't have the right to kill me. He could have went on about the injustice of him being against the law. But no. No. He's going to try and reach him. Now, point number two. One, you've got to know a battle's coming. Don't be surprised when it hits. Have a plan in place of how to, how to act and not react in a situation. Number two, this is huge, very important. It requires faith. This is faith that's genuine and real, not just a Sunday school word, not not just a terminology used, but it is in the difficult times that faith is actually required. You don't need much faith when everything's going great. You don't. This is why Ephesians even describes a shield of faith, because the measure of protection it gives you Faith deals, we know from Hebrews 11, verse 1, what you cannot see. And many times, if it's something that you cannot see, you cannot even understand. Might not even agree with what is taking place. When the enemy is beating you down, when life is tough, you have to see what you cannot in the moment, and that requires faith. You need to be able to see God, regardless of how bad it is. Regardless. You have to be able to see where God's at. As Hebrews 11, 1 says, you better get focused on the evidence of God in the situation. 
This requires faith. When you feel like life is just crushing, the enemies are all around, you have got to be able to see the evidence of God. You've got to be able to see God. To have faith that He is there, that He is in control. Even at the times when things are overwhelming, when the enemy is beating, you think it's over. You have to know. You have to know. You have to know by faith God is in control. This in no way means bad things won't happen. That is, such a mis- that is such a lie of the devil. I've even had Christians come in for counseling because they don't understand as if they put something on God that he's never promised where he's made very clear just the opposite. It in no way is a promise that bad things won't happen. This throws off multitudes. The truth is, bad things will happen. We live in an evil world. The day will come with a new heaven and a new earth when all that is done away with. But the Lord is clear, that time is not now. The apostles who gave their life to Christ, they all were martyred. There is great peace in the midst of suffering when faith sees the evidence of God or simply looks to God, of knowing God is there, He is in control. So be it. Paul knew heading in that day he'd be surrounded by enemies and this could go very bad. You could just imagine Paul there as he's presenting himself and the Jews. I wonder wonder if the Jews from Ephesus had caught Paul's eye. I mean, he's there for three years. I have no doubt. I mean, remember, he taught in their synagogue initially. And he's like, oh, I see him. And then they start to shout. Paul was not surprised. The mob grabs him. Listen to me. He resolved himself to accept the situation. You can see his game plan he had coming in. He was not crying out, God, this isn't fair. God, I'm your servant. God, where are you? God, why are you letting the devil do this? It's not his plea. To respond this way requires faith. Paul Please understand this. When this is going on, when the beatings, even when we think this could be it in this moment, Paul knew God is in control. Paul knew that. If this is what God allows, so be it. He will use it. It requires faith. When your world is imploding, to respond like Job. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Paul accepted what he could not control, but he knew God was in control. I want you to think about this. Paul is arrested. The the balk, he, he will have some time out of prison. The balk, the rest of his life, is going to be imprisoned. I want you to think what he said about this imprisonment later on. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read them to you for time's sake. Ephesians 3, 1. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Philemon chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Uh, Other places as well, he says that. He never says, a prisoner of Rome. He never says, a prisoner as a result of the action of the Judaizers. He says, I am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying? This is all of God. I'm in prison unjustly, but this is all of God. This is how he chose to respond. He saw God in this situation even though it would be very difficult. 
Many times our own suffering can go on longer when we open our, and we open ourselves up to bitterness because we don't accept as what has happened and just simply looking to God to trust Him knowing He is in control and move on. Even in this situation, we see God's sovereignty at work. I mean, think about this. Paul is arrested, the beating begins. But guess who happens to be right there? The man in power for the entire region. He is so close that he is able to get there before he is dead. You think that's a coincidence? No, it's not. All of God. All of God. You can see where God is in control. You can see the evidence of God as you read this. Another way we see God working in this, not only His presence, it's in that Paul, it's in that God gave Paul favor before the commander. He could have just came down and said, you know what, kill him. I really don't care. You got a legal right, do it. Take him out. But as you read, not only here does, does God puts in, that's not a coincidence. It's not just happened to be so. It's because of God's sovereignty at work. God, before this commander of the Roman army stationed in Jerusalem, he put in his heart uh, to have favor upon Paul. Because not only does he save him here, he's going to save his life again. It's not coincidence. There are times when you need to look to God by faith and trust him when life is overwhelming. Another example of this, this is my favorite. I'm going to read this verse again. Verse number 40, it says this. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people, and when there was made a great silence. This is the sovereignty of God. This is a mob. They hate this man. They've been, it's, it's the Feast of Pentecost. They're there about the law, and in all their minds, this man is against the law. He's against Moses. He just brought a Gentile uh, uh, past the outer court. They want him dead. Paul asked for permission to speak because God had given favor. He says, yes, you may speak to the mob. Give me that commission. No, listen, this is not the time for this. We're just going to get you out of here. But the Lord was in control. You have to look and see the evidence of God. As Hebrews 11 directs us, this is how faith works. And the the biggest miracle of all this is right now. Paul goes to address the mob. Picture the scene. There's thousands upon thousands upon thousands present. It's not 200 people yelling, away with him, crucify him, kill him. The man they want dead stands up to speak and he simply puts his hand up. And a great silence comes over the crowd. That's all of God. That's all of God. It's the same term used here that's in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1 about the silence in heaven. Incredible. This would be so awesome to see. I think it all struck the entire crowd. I mean, they're yelling, they're shouting. The man, that, not the commander doesn't, Paul does. Silent. My last point. It also requires hope. All right? When life is overwhelming, enemies are beating you down, or circumstances are tough, whatever it is, when you have to know tough times are coming, don't be ignorant to that fact. Know how you're going to respond ahead of time. It requires faith of simply knowing God's in control. I know this isn't good, but God is in control. God knows. i got to trust him. You stay faithful. You stay right. You don't quit. You don't get bitter. 
And then there's hope. Oh, this is, this is good. This is where hope can actually, in the midst of difficult times, produce joy. By this, what I mean is this. What I mean by using hope here in this is that we know God's ability to turn something evil into something good. He does it all the time. That's where the hope comes from. Regardless of the evil of the situation, that God can take that and actually turn it into something good. <clears throat> if you have faith and you can hope, how God can use it. I th- 1 Peter 4, 19, I'll just read it. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. It's this that you are committing to God. I know it's difficult. I know the suffering is hitting, but you commit it to God is in control. God, you can use this. So let's look at just what occurs as a result of this. How God turns something evil into something good. Paul, in context, was obeying and submitting to the pastor at Jerusalem by taking a Nazarite vow and going to the temple to present himself. He's not in rebellion. This action of him doing what he should be doing has led to him getting beaten severely almost to the point of death and he is arrested. Yet there is great hope because of how God can use this. See, Paul was settled in his mind before he ever got to Jerusalem. Whatever God chooses to happen, so be it. He accepted it. And he knew there was great hope because he knew how God could use it. I mean, he didn't know the specific ways. Only thing he had to understand was there is some way that God can choose to use this. Even if he doesn't understand it, even if he can't uh, put together in his mind how it can be used, only thing he can have is hope in this, that God does have that ability, that God does know what he can do. So as a result of this imprisonment, of what takes place on this day, four of Paul's most beautiful written epistles are created. Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians. I mean, Philippians, dealing with how Christ is our life. Colossians, how, how, how after you see who Christ really is, his preeminence, how we're to seek him in those things which are above. The beauty of Ephesians covering great subjects like our relationships with each other in marriage and church. The armor of God. Philemon with a beautiful portrait of the gospel itself. It is through this arrest that the gospel will go to two governors, Felix and Festus, and King Agrippa. Through this arrest, not only that, let me read to you from Philippians 1.12, which is written during this imprisonment. But I would, you should understand, brethren, the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. He's saying, I'm in prison, you don't have to worry. I see how God is using it. How he's taken something that's bad and turned it into something that is incredible. He said, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. Do you understand what he just said? In Philippians 4, he'll make another reference to it. He's in Rome when he writes that. He is saying, the gospel itself has went into the palace. Caesar's household. And then he goes on to say in verse 14, And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So here's Paul. He's in prison in Rome, but he sees, he has hope at how God is using this. And and that book of Philippians, he mentions joy 12 times. It is the epistle. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. He's in prison unjustly. All because it, he, he knew he's apart from the uh, injustice of the mob because of who he is in Christ, that God is the one who's in control. And he can see already how God is using an injustice for good. The truth is God has done that throughout Scripture. 
I don't have time to go into it. I'm going to finish up here. We see examples of this like Joseph and his brothers when his brothers tried to kill him and then they sold him as a slave. God was in control of every bit of that. He turned something evil into good. And Joseph had to tell his brothers that over and over. Because at, at the end, they thought for sure retribution was going to come. But Joseph's faith was in God. Joseph knew God's in control of all of this. Daniel taken into captivity. Ruth in the death of her husband. Example after example of where faith and hope can take you when life doesn't go as planned. You stay faithful with the Lord. You trust Him. Don't blame him for something he's never promised. He is the one who is there. He is the one who can carry you through. He is the one. You just have to see the evidence of how he can use it. Trust him. There is hope in your situation regardless. Because God can turn something that is evil into something that is good. Now before I close... This message was for Christians, but I want, you to, I, want to, I want to ask you this question. If you were to die right now, where would you go? If your soul was to depart your, your body on this day, death finds you, is your soul going to heaven or hell? I want you to listen to me right now. This will take two minutes. Listen to me. Don't miss this. The Bible tells us what's going to happen after you die. The Bible unveils that mystery that my, mankind is trying to solve. The Bible tells us that it's appointed on a man once to die, but after this, the judgment. A day will come when you will be judged of your Creator. That day will happen. You will be judged. When He judges you, it's based upon His law. We have an enormous problem then, because all of us are guilty. Every single one of us has broken the law. You say, yes, but I'm not as bad as other people. i got news for you. If, if James here decides to become a bank robber, and he stands before the judge here on this earth, which we're crooked. God's justice is perfect. He stands before a judge, and, and, and he's guilty. They have the evidence, and he knows he's guilty. He says, judge, I am guilty, but you've got to look at everything else in my life. I mean, I've been in church. I've done a lot of good things. Is the judge going to say, you know what, you're right, go free. Or is he going to be held accountable for the law that he did break? He will be held accountable for that law, and so will you before Almighty God. You see, in order to escape that judgment, let me bring this fact up, just so you know, Revelation chapter 20 and 21, every single person found guilty at that judgment is cast into a lake of fire. Every single one. Something has to happen where it looks as if you are perfect. None of us are. Not a one of us. It's, it, it's, it's, so something has to take place when you stand before God. It looks as if you have never broken the law. That's God's requirement. So in order to save you, for that to take place, what God did is incredible. He himself became a man 2,000 years ago. He became a man 2,000 years ago. He walked on this earth as a man, and he lived the perfect life life. The only one who's ever done it. So now you have for the first time in all of history a man who can go to the judgment day and a father could say you're innocent. Listen to me. He lived that perfect life for you. When he went to the cross, the Bible tells us what that was all about in one verse. It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 for he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All of us have probably heard the phrase that Jesus died for you. We just don't understand what it means. What it means is described in that verse. Is that God placed upon Jesus your guilt, your sin, as if he was the one who broke the law. And he judged him in your place. But because Jesus is God, he defeated hell. And after three days and three nights, he defeated death and rose again from the dead. All right. If you go to hell, you're not God. You're not coming out. At the same time he takes your sin, that verse tells us he gives you his perfect life, his righteousness. He literally changes places with you. I will take your sin. I'll have God as the judge judge me to satisfy justice. And I will give you my perfect life. And God said, through my grace and my love, I'll accept that.
that will work. You see, he died to make it look as if you have never sinned. You say, okay, well, how does that save me? (laughs) Repentance and faith in Christ alone. Not in baptism, not in this church, not in doing good works. It is you recognizing your need of Christ and placing your faith in him alone, nothing else. The example I will close with is the thief on the cross. When Christ died, two men died with him on each side. The one thief spoke up and said this, if thou be the Christ, get us down from here. The Lord never addresses that man, says nothing to him. The other thief, though, on the other side, he speaks up. He tells the other thief, you need to shut up. We deserve to be here. This man hath done nothing wrong. And this is all he does. He looks at the Lord. He's dying. He never asked to come down from the cross. What he is afraid of is the moment death finds him, what's going to happen? He says to the Lord, Lord, and notice he addresses him, Lord, when thou comest into thy kingdom, remember me. The Lord turned to him and said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Whatever he just did, it worked. He didn't say, sorry, you know what, you didn't get baptized yet. Sorry, you didn't have time to join a church. Sorry, I don't take deathbed confessions. What that man did was this. He recognized his own guilt and his sin of how filthy he was. And he knows if I die like this, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I'm a bad. And all of us need to see ourselves as wicked as we are. Quit convincing yourself by this lie of our culture that how good we all are. I mean, look at our culture. We're evil at heart. We are. We need laws and guidelines to keep us in check. We need chastisements and threats of imprisonments and beatings just to keep us in line. And yet, like we like to claim at how good we are. He recognized how evil he was, facing judgment. And all he did was place his faith in the only one who could save him, Jesus Christ. If you'll come to him in faith, he will save you. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Let me ask this question. How many of you here right now say, Pastor, I know that if I died, I would go to heaven. I know it. I remember the day of my conversion. I remember that day, just like that thief on the cross, when I, when I knew how wicked I was, and I knew he was the only answer, and I placed my faith in him alone. If you've done that, would you, would you raise your hand for me? All over the building. Many hands going up. Okay, you can put your hands down. Now, is there anyone here say, Pastor, I could not raise my hand there. I could not. I don't know that that's taking place, or it has not. Please, Pastor, I do want you to pray for me. Would you just raise your hand for me? Anybody here like that, just slide your hand up. You can put it back down. Yes, I see that one there. You can put your hand down over to my right. Anybody else? Say, Pastor, please pray for me. Yes, I see that hand in the back as well. Anybody else? Now listen, for those who raised your hand, I want you to listen. This is not a coincidence you're here. What God did to save you 2,000 years ago is true. He loves you. He died to save you from that judgment. It's so true. If you'll come to him in repentance and faith, he will save you. I heard that message on June 30th of 1982. Tears streaming down my face, and that preacher asked me, would you like to place your faith in Christ now? Yes, I would, I said. I see it. I see what it means that he died for me. Now, I'm going to pray for you both in just a second. You say, Pastor... I would like somebody to talk with me about it right now. I don't want to leave here without somebody talking with me about it. What I can do is I can send somebody to you right now, a lady or or a man if you're a man, and they can just take you aside and go over what I just talked about. Not about this church, nothing else, just to make you understand what Christ did for you. I would implore you to do that. Say, Pastor, yes, I I would like somebody to talk with me. If you would like that, just slip your hand up. I'll send somebody right to you very quietly and do this. Yes, I I would like to talk with somebody. If you would like that, just slip your hand back up for me. All right, I'll pray for you. 
And if you want to even talk after the service, I'm more than willing to talk. But the Bible tells us he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Father in heaven, I do pray that you bless his invitation. Lord, I thank you for the, couple who, the, the, the few people who raised their hand concerning salvation. Lord, I do pray for them. Lord, I do pray for that conviction that the message of the gospel would be clear. And Lord, I do pray it would get to the point where they would, in fact, place their faith in Christ, calling upon him in faith to save them. Lord, I pray that you, you would work with those who do know you, those who could raise their hand. Lord, I pray even now. Lord, maybe they're facing difficult situations. Lord, I pray that you work on their heart. Lord, let them see you through the eyes of faith in what's taking place. Lord, remind them of the hope that is there of how you can use even something that's evil and how you can turn it into good. Lord, please bless and work. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Turn to page 456. And if you need to come and pray this morning, this altar is open. You can come to the Lord and pray. Don't wait.